All right. Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, it's my turn. I picked a story that I found randomly by Googling around for stories <laughs> about a week before we recorded. So this is not something that I came into knowing much about. And then I do what I always do when I pick a story, <laughs> which is really lazy. But I read like four or five paragraphs. And if I'm like, yes, I still want to read, then I just send a link to you. <laughs> ah, okay. And then I read it and discover it for myself. So there, like sometimes there's a story that I'm familiar with, but this one was just kind of one where I was like, yeah, this is definitely going somewhere. I'm definitely into it. Let's see what happens and so we are going to discover alongside each other dear listener but this is a story called the saddest case of true love by simon van buoy i will read a section without knowing why soyun said she left her hiding place and went up the metal stairs to the glass office she knew there was an orange metal box with a red cross on it she had seen it before they had the same one at her school it was full of medicine and white ribbon when soyun got to the top of the stairs the office was very bright and there was glass on the floor her mother was slumped over sobbing then she saw her daughter standing there go play she said weakly Sitting in the office chair bleeding was Soyeon's father, the man who'd held her mother's hand at the zoo, who had fed Soyeon imitation crab as she played on the carpet. There was also blood on his cheeks and on the white collar of his shirt, but mostly it dripped to the floor and onto his black shoes. Soyeon got the orange box and took the lid off. She did not feel afraid. She took out two rolls of bandage and went to her father. She could see his eyes clearly. The expression in them made her feel good. Soyeon took the bandage and went around and around. Her only concern was to get it straight. She had wrapped dolls before, but this man was not a doll. At first, the blood came through in dots like eyes watching. Then the bandage stayed white. So Yun's mother stood up and was looking. Her father could not use his hands for anything, so kept them in the air like he was surprised at everything that had happened in the toy factory. So I feel like I should explain the structure of this story. Yeah, I was going to say the first line in there. So Yun said she left her hiding place kind of demonstrates, you know, how it's yeah. being told. And it is weird. I think sometimes it works and I think sometimes it doesn't. So that's part of what I wanted to talk about as a whole. Mm-hmm. But uh, the story basically starts out where the narrator says, and it's told in first person, that he like comes home and he's got a letter from this this chick saying her dad died. And he's like, what? What is this? And his <laughs> wife, his wife's like, yeah, what is this? And it's a letter from this woman that he met when he was abroad briefly. And I forget now why he was abroad briefly alone. But he was like in another country alone alone for a little bit, which makes more sense now that we know that this author is from uh, England. So it's not it's not like he like flew across the pond when he went to Italy. He just like popped over. But anyway, he's in Italy by himself and he met this woman named Soyeon who was like a caretaker who had a key for him so he could stay at a hotel, right? It's this like tangential character to him who ends up offering to like take him around town that night. And he like doesn't really want to do it, but he feels like he should. So he says yes. And they talk a little bit as she's like walking him to whatever they're going to go to like drinks or dinner. She's she's telling him he has to see some part of the city at night. And after the small talk with him, she just like starts talking and it's like she doesn't stop. And so right. when he remembers this letter, he's like kind of taken aback because for him this night, he recalls it as like this weird encounter with this stranger he never talked to since who spent the whole night blabbing about herself. And then it turns out that like this was at least Soyeon thinks that this was an important conversation for him. But she spends the whole night telling him about her father, who was basically, he had his own family when he met her mother and got her pregnant. And so like was not in her life growing up, but showed up a couple times, would get abusive with the mom. And then at the end of his life was at like her mercy because he had like suffered a stroke. And so the mother comes back and takes care of this man that never married her and beat her up a bunch. And then when when he dies, Soyeon sends the narrator a a letter and is like, by the way, my dad died. And he's like, what? So I can I can picture this happening, right? We all have these like, I don't know, this is like your high school friend texting you and being like, oh my God, that girl we didn't like in high school 30 years ago, she died. It feels random to him that way. And so the story then unfolds that he has to explain this evening to his wife. And he's kind of explaining it to us. He's not directly talking to his wife throughout the story. He's like telling us what happened. And then by the end, we get the sense that he's also told his wife. Yeah. And so it's not like direct. It's not like, and then I told her. It's like, he's telling us. He's still talking to us. But then by the end, we get the sense that they've had this exact conversation over cocktails in the backyard after the letter arrived. And the story's title 
title is The Saddest Case of True Love. And I feel like I got to give it away. But Soyeon is convinced that her parents had a love story. And by the end, the narrator and his wife were sitting in their backyard, like completely removed from this reality, except that it happened to a stranger and they've heard it. It's like watching a movie, right? So you don't feel invested in it. And yet by the end, they're like, yeah, that is the saddest case of true love. But I think what they're agreeing with is not the true love bit. I think it's the saddest bit. And I think that's why that's what felt different. I feel like it's like that's like so subtle and maybe I'm totally off base, but that's what that's what I feel like they're agreeing to. They're kind of agreeing that like this is the saddest story of true love and also that it's not between the mother and father. It's between the daughter and the father, right? It is so sad that the daughter loves this man who wasn't there for her and who treated her mother like garbage. And yet she is so enamored by him for her whole life that, you know, she sends this letter to a random guy to let him know. (laughs) He's like, I remember your dad. You told me he was terrible. So you don't have to read it now because my description was sufficient. (laughs) You learned everything you need to know and feel. Well, I think it's still worth reading because there's some cool stuff in here, but um, the way it's depicted. I thought it was, uh, there's a little ambiguity at the ending there. Yeah. Where he says, uh, my wife picked up the postcard and read aloud the part Soyun had written about her father dying peacefully at the care facility in Korea. I hadn't thought so before, but now we both agreed. It was the saddest case of true love we had ever heard. And the we both and we both agreed. It's like, is that he and his wife? Or is that Soyun and him? I don't know. Oh, I took it to mean the wife. I, I, I did originally, like I, but, but thinking about it, because Soyun is the one who first said, isn't that the saddest case of true love? And he was like, eh. And then now he's agreeing with her. But it might also, it probably at the exact same time means all three of them agree. I don't know. But that um, there's other moments of ambiguity in here too. That just seemed like one last ambiguous ending. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could read into this and like explain why I still think it's the it's the wife, but I, I get now what you're saying. And even if it's not ambiguous in that exact sentence structure, I get that he could be agreeing with her as well, the daughter. So the structure, as confusing as that was, is basically like a story within a story told after the fact. (laughs) Yeah. You know, we talk about like stories within stories and it's almost like, let me tell you about this thing that happened to me today, you know? And then it's like, almost like it's a little more present somehow. This is like, let me tell you about a thing that happened forever ago, which is, it feels different that way. Because I think this goes back to, I don't think it is uh, ambiguous at the end. I think the point is that so much time has passed and it's come out of the blue that his conclusion now is only while bouncing it off his wife is different than it was. So uh, when we were not recording, when we finished our last episode, we mentioned only tourists remember the Alamo, which is like one of the first podcasts that we recorded. And I mentioned that I liked stories that are like told in hindsight. And this I feel fits that bill to a degree. He didn't write this story the night that he met this woman and was kind of like surprised by her. He wrote it years later and it adds so much to his takeaway, right? He's basically saying like, I had and thought so before but now we both agreed it was the saddest case and it's like the passage of time the fact that it was this surprise letter all those factors but there's something about like telling a story in hindsight right because when he retells us now he's retelling us now knowing that all that time has passed right yeah he's a different person i think the reason i read that last line as being ambiguous is because i think it's ambiguous and i think you you hit on this when you said that it's not clear if he's just telling us or if he's also saying these words out loud to his wife but his relationship with soyun is not there's some it feels like there's something else hidden in it like it's ambiguous exactly what happens like when she invites him back to her house she says uh oh wow i see where you're going john yeah <laughs> okay so she invites him i can't find the exact line but if she invites him back and then they they go wait at a bus stop and then right. he reflects later and remembers her face in the window of the bus right which you know suggests that he didn't go with her but he never says it outright but at the beginning of her conversation with him she asks him she began to ask questions how did i meet my wife how old were my two daughters did i have any pets I answered in a friendly way, but was too tired to give details. Those three, those specific questions come up when she starts to describe her father and his affair with her mother. When she describes him, the rom- this romance went on privately for a good while because the businessman, her father, lived outside Seoul in a house with his wife, teenage daughters, and a gray kitten. Those are the exact same three things that she asked him about. Wow. So I made be, this connection. <laughs> you'd be really, really good on uh, Instagram stock 
fucking if if the need arose. I don't know what that means. <laughs> like it's like, oh, I think my spouse is cheating. And I think that because Oh, oh, that no. It's because in, in writing, you know, you set up residences. You deliberately yeah. do that so that we unconsciously, consciously, there's something that makes us pair up one character with another. And I felt like some of that was being done by pairing up the narrator with her father. Yeah. This goes back to my general feeling as a in an expert writer that a lot of the stuff is not intentionally planted. So <laughs> so but but to your point, like if it is, it's right there. Yeah, that's why um I don't know. I don't know that I like ambiguous stuff. I right. like to be told outright. I don't like digging into it and trying to find these parallels and trying to like piece together what might have happened beneath the surface. But I don't know. When you don't tell me, what am I supposed to do? But really dig in, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm I'm totally on board with you. I hate it's not that I hate trying hard. I just think that like a straightforward story can be as clever, right? I think people sometimes think they're being clever when they are like obscuring something. Like, oh, that's enough with the tricks, man. You can still make me cry if you just tell me. Yeah, just tell me. Yeah, or you can still make me go, oh my God, can you believe it? But I mean, it doesn't really make sense that they would have gotten together because he knew her for less than a couple of hours. I don't even know why she invited him back to her house. It didn't make sense. She like, seemed who to is me. this person? <laughs> yeah, okay. So like the way this story is told, if this narrator wanted to, he could have easily confess to us, the reader, even though his wife's in the scene, like what happened? And he doesn't. And I think it's because it probably nothing happened. Yeah. My read on this character, because the whole time I'm waiting for that as well, right? The first time you read this, you're like, what's this girl want? You know, my take on this character, though, like by the end, especially is kind of like, she's probably the person that tells the, the guy in line at the coffee store about her dad. You know, she seems like just an open book. But um, mm. more than that, like kind of like she's got this huge thing inside of her and she wants to share it. Don't you know people like that who are just like dealing with so much, whether it's like actual trauma or just like they're an anxious person and it's all balled up and you you start talking to them and they it's just they unload because they need that and they really like to do that and it's like the difference between what is it like an, an, an introvert and an extrovert she's clearly an extrovert like an introvert is drained by this kind of encounter and she seems to be like filled up by it right she seems to kind of like thrive on getting it out she's like me like I gotta complain about stuff before I <laughs> get that it out is of my true head. I do know people who will just start spooling out a story like that i'm like whoa yeah. <laughs> yeah she just seems like um and that's that why that's kind of why it goes back to my what i said at the beginning talking about how i think this what he's saying when he says it is a sad love story more about how she feels about her father and less about how the mother feels about the father um, because he could have easily, Simon could have easily as the writer have gotten straight to the point and had this main character encounter the mother and the mother tells the abuse of her estranged husband or spouse, right? Partner who knocked her up. But that's not what happened. Like we hear the story from the daughter's perspective, because I think if it's correct and it's her story, then her story is about loving her father desperately. Yes. Yeah. That's true. She seems like enamored by this guy, right? Like he didn't exist in her life fully. So she's she's got to keep telling and reminding people that he he was around and he he was a real person. Like he didn't raise her, but like listen to these highlight reels, you know? I'm thinking about this in terms of like, yeah, I think you're right. This is about her and her relationship with him. And she tells the story through as if she's telling it about her parents, like her mother, but she's yeah. really talking about herself. But I don't know. I, I wonder, I'm trying to think of what the, uh, the role of the narrator is to that why why present it in this way because you know in the last episode we talked about how the character who's telling the story should be the focus of, or at least should be affected by the story and he is obviously affected but is is there more than that i feel like there's so many layers to this there's this, the current scene which he then he talks about what he did going to florence to meet her and then there's the layer of he's telling the story of their conversation which is her telling a story Story of her life story and then within that you know there's other little there's scenes and there's there's like these several layers deep why do we need to know why do we need to have it layered like that what does that gain us in the story that's why i think that there's more to this narrator than is suggested i yeah. think that's why or i feel like the story is kind of wants there to be more or i'm compelled to look for more because of that right well like without talking to simon yeah it's hard to know but i feel like if simon had presented this story to us in our workshop like the first thing i would have pointed out is why do we got to hear this from the narrator yeah yeah that's right <laughs> 
And he might have had a good answer, but I might have still gone with my gut and said, like, what is the character? What does he add? I think my argument, like, at face value without, like, thinking too hard about it, you know, if I'm because because it does lend something to it. But I think it's like perspective. I think that's all it is. And I think we could have gotten that perspective even without this, like, stretch of time, without the wife, without the letter. We could have gotten the perspective if he had gone back to his hotel room that night and thought to himself, like, yeah, really sad case of true love, right? So there's something about I, I get what you're saying, like why add all of this complexity if not to allude to like something more and what the fuck did we miss but also like does it really need to be there is there really that much more because if simon's answer was that there wasn't i would probably tell him to like strip this away and then here's the other thing stories like this are almost like so complex in their details and they're right like so i got a letter from this woman and this is 20 years ago and i'm sitting with my wife blah blah it's almost like the setup is almost so specific that it makes me wonder if this, if there was something true about this, you know, not necessarily for the author, but it's like, you know, if my mom was going to tell me this story, this is exactly how she would like write it down. Right. Yeah. Like, well, this happened a long time ago, but I'm going to tell you now instead of like, I don't know, sometimes writers when it's real can't strip away what's unnecessary. So I wonder if all of this was real somehow. That's a good point. That is a problem. Like there's a story that I try to write. I've tried to write it several times and uh, it's not about me but i was there and i can't pull myself out of it you know so yeah i have to somehow tell the story as if it's about me well but like would you argue then that you didn't matter to that story like without getting into details like you're compelled to tell it that way because that's how you experienced it but i i would argue that like if you are going to stay true to like whatever it has happened in this situation like your perspective is the story right your interpretation of what happened while you were there is probably different than the people that experienced it right so so yes. you telling it the way you experienced it is important if only to keeping it true. Yeah, but I could totally tell the story without me in it. I could tell the story of the people and what happened to them. And right. I have to fictionalize it quite a bit and I wouldn't need to be in it. I really wouldn't. It would probably be a better story that way. It might be a better story, but would you agree that whatever perspective you're bringing to it is a result of having been there yourself? Oh yeah, of course. But I mean, that's the, the role of a narrator. You know, I wouldn't put it in first person. Right. It's the role of a narrator, but like, because it's true is the difference. Yeah, I would have to fiction it. I don't think I could. Uh, otherwise, you know, why tell the story? Like, this is the problem, a potential problem. I don't know that there really is a problem here. I'm going to be picking at the smallest little nit you could possibly find. But if I were to turn the situation I'm thinking of into an actual story about that situation and not about me, then I could totally pull myself out of it and it would be the same story. And I think, I don't know that you could pull this narrator out and have this be the same story. There's something, okay, because yeah. the, the ending is we've decided that this is the saddest case of true love you know you kind of need that observer effect for it well and here's the other twist because without knowing what you're writing it sounds like if you were to fictionalize it in a way that removed yourself then you wouldn't even be a character on the page no i wouldn't even be a character yeah well in this situation he's a character so we're talking about whether he's a character and a narrator in a sense like why is he narrating this now versus then right well i think the another way to write this story would be from soyun's perspective as right. if she's telling it yes just like you can write it like uh that grace paley story goodbye and good luck uh where she's just sitting there telling the story it could be like that and then yeah. we would lose everything we gain by having this guy kind of with his weird interaction with his wife and then their conclusion at the end in that grace paley story i remember talking about this there is like the slightest hint that she's talking to her niece the entire time yes yeah, so she even, is talking even to her. A story, even a story like that requires a foil to get the true point. Yeah, but what I'm saying is then you'd strip away him. Like, he doesn't need to be... You can just have her talking. To like, okay, we're walking. She's walking through town and talking. And the whole story could just be her talking. You don't need to have, oh, yeah, that time I went to Florence and then I, I ate a sad little meal on the patio with the broken furniture. And then I had to go return the key. And she, and I was like, oh, I forgot I was supposed to meet this girl from the shop and like walk her around the town or Walk with her around town, but she was waiting for me anyway. She had a ponytail. And then you launch into it. It's just, you launch into it. I totally get it. I think that because... 
because this, like you said, because this narrator is in it, he, like, this author, Simon thinks that they're, like, important. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah, but as a reader, it's like, whoa. I think that's the point, is I think that there is something that's being gained here. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what that is. I think it's perspective. I just, I, th- I think that's all it is. It could, you're probably right. You are probably right. But it just makes me wonder what would happen if you stripped it out. That's all. I'm not saying oh, you I, should yeah. strip it out. And, and okay. like you said before, if he came to our workshop, we'd probably tell him to strip it out. And yeah, you'd be like, you guys are idiots. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But it leads to these things like, I don't know exactly what to do with this. I'm looking for ambiguous statements. I'm trying to make connections that aren't there. So, you know, there's, I feel like we switched sides on this conversation halfway through. All I want to hear you say is I agree with you. So No, no, no. I have to switch <laughs> to the other side when you change. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, th- I think we're, yeah, you're right. We're not like trying to diagnose this thing. We're just trying to like figure out why I did it. Yeah. And you're right. You're absolutely right. He did it for the perspective. It seemed that seems like the the right answer. But when I, like I said, when I read it, I was looking for weird connections that probably aren't there. Well, you mentioning that has my mind thinking about all the things. So like, it's nice to point out like that you can read this as, you know, a hundred people could read this and half of them would be reading into it, you know, and kind of wondering the same types of things. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you want to mention about this one? There's another line in here that I underlined, but I think I underlined it because of the line from the previous one, which is the charcoal <laughs> and the white light. This is another one talking about streets, and it said, uh, we near the top of the Piazza of Michelangelo. Sunlight filled the streets like gold fabric. And I was like, our writers just, they don't know how to describe streets, and they have to come up with these like lines of beauty just to do it every time. <laughs> it's Florence, John. This is like wow. every girl that studies abroad, and she's like, and it was beautiful i didn't see a single piece of garbage or a pigeon none whatsoever <laughs> no pigeons <laughs> no pigeons or garbage it was just croissants and money but i like that line sunlight filled the streets like gold fabric i do think that you know as writers we have we keep how many times have the streets of florence been described in millions if not a billion different uh yeah. books or stories and we got to find something new every time we were right at time like can this possibly be new let me find some way to say this that i'm pretty sure no one else has said before well one way to do it is to make it not florence just some city in the west <laughs> that's right <laughs> and then it becomes extremely inventive but yeah this is like one of those settings that's just like so idealized we were in paris texas we were in Paris and the sky was full of pigeons. Also, it was Texas. <laughs> Gross. Okay. I don't think I have anything else to say about this. And I'll have to think a second on my takeaway. Do you have one that comes to mind? Yeah, my takeaway was something about ambiguity. And I guess after the conversation we just had, I, I guess uh, my takeaway should be be careful with it. <laughs> Like, make sure that that's what you want to do. If there's something that you're trying not to say for some reason, figure out why you're not saying it. I don't know. I don't know if if maybe my advice would be like leave clues or just make sure you consider all the connections or because that's like, how do you project what 10,000 different human brains will do with your story if you don't answer the question? Right. So maybe the advice should be try not to be ambiguous. <laughs> and like you said, like a half an hour ago, whenever it was, we can still get emotion out of it if you tell us. <laughs> yeah, that's I think we're on the same page that way. Like I, I enjoy direct writing. I don't think anything's lost. We talk about this a lot in the workshop when people want to talk about genre and like, oh, I wrote this thing. What's what's the genre? I'm like, I don't know. I don't care. The only genre I've ever like defined on my own is like YA because I feel like it's always straightforward. It's rarely ambiguous because the point is to be understood by an audience that's, you know, still kind of learning to read and enjoy these like novel length things on their own. Yeah. Nothing is lost. They're, Harry Potter is just as exciting. I guess the other half of my takeaway is that thing I was mentioned before about the layering. Because when when there's ambiguity, I do try to make those connections. You know, when it's a story being told about a story being told about a story being told. Right. And I want to find where the bottom layer connects with the top layer. Right. And if there's an ambiguous connection, then I'm going to invent things. Right. Whereas if you make those connections really clear, you know, then they align with each other and then it's not ambiguous. But I, you know, that structure of layering stories being told about stories being told is, uh, is also another interesting thing to consider when you're writing. Right. 
I guess my takeaway is kind of what I was talking about when I mentioned the other story, only tourists remember the Alamo. I just, I personally just enjoy stories like this that are told well after the fact. Like, you know, okay, like the best example is always like a breakup story, right? Like mm. if you break up with someone and you write a story that day, it's probably going to suck, right? If you wait a <laughs> week, it probably gets a little bit better. And if you wait like 10 years and then write it, the story is no longer the breakup. It is like what you've learned like directly and indirectly about that breakup in the interview intervening years and the fact that you're telling it a certain way now and usually what comes to those stories and what I most enjoy is like a first person narrator just like telling the reader what they think of like their younger self almost right they're like and this is what I thought then and there's something about telling a story that way that it just feels like almost without directly saying anything you're just like transferring all of this wisdom to your reader you know it's like when your grandma tells you a story about when she was little and you just feel wiser for having heard it from her while she's old right versus is like reading her diary or something like you want to know what she thinks of it so stories like this I like because lots of time has passed and I think going back to what we talked about I think for me at least my biggest what I learned from this story is like the kind of perspective you can gain on yourself or on someone else when it's been this long right so to go back to it like Soyeon her father just died in present day but when this is happening it sounds like he's still alive she's telling this man about him the love story between her parents seems so immediate for her she's still in it it's like writing about the breakup the day of and like it's not that good to hear about it but maybe if Soyeon was gonna write about her dad in 10 years after his death she would have learned something about how she viewed him then and she might have come to this conclusion herself that it was a very sad love story but not why she thought it was and she might feel different about her dad you know she seems like she's in the the throes of her emotion she's in the thick of it and this narrator is able to like look at it with a different eye and that's what I like about stories like this so your takeaway is basically that the story needs that narrator despite like the bulk of this episode's argument about whether he needed to be there yeah i okay here's my thing it needs it i hate reading stories like this oh yeah okay. i hate it i hate it when it's like hey i'm so and so but enough about me <laughs> Well, why'd you waste my time, buddy? You know, is this, he pulled it off really well, though. Like, I was yeah. I was transported. Oh, yeah. I was in Florence, man. I saw that gold fabric. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's it. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.